Welcome to our Quantum Leap Advantage audio newsletter. As I mentioned at the end of our last audio uh, newsletter, we would use the information, the tools, the guidelines, the methodologies that I set forth on building the dream team from the chairman, including the additional board members, our outside big six accounting firm, our outside international national and hopefully international law firm. Now, once we have this dream team, which I call the in-house and the outhouse team, what do we do with them? Now, in the flow of building a company exponentially, I mean building a company by acquisition. The next step beyond building your dream team is interviewing a financial institutions, both traditional and non-traditional, so you have both the debt and the equity investors for your acquisition. Now, first of all, some of this is going to be some repetition from some of the other information I put forth on the first few audio tapes, but it's worth repeating. As I've told people in the recent seminars, the reason why the QLA, the Quantum Leap Advantage seminar, is three days long is because the information cannot be absorbed in one day. It cannot be absorbed in two days. It needs replication. We will have replication within this tape and all the rest of the series of tapes as long as we have QLA uh, audio, audio uh, newsletters because it's necessary. So where do we find financial institutions? Well, one of the first places to look, if financial institutions have budgets and they're advertising, it's because they need customers. If financial institutions are, I'm talking about traditional financial institutions, and by traditional I mean these are commercial banks for the most part at this juncture. Much of what I say both applies for commercial banks and non-commercial banks. If financial institutions open up branches, what does a branch have that's opened up in an area that it didn't have before? Well, one of the things it doesn't have, it doesn't have customers. These, for, for the size companies that are probably, for the most part, are listening to this tape and listening to most of my tapes, the companies are startups to small, startups to a half a million dollars in revenue. If you're a startup from a half a million dollars in revenue down to zero, then any time a branch opens, you ought to be there like stink on a skunk. You ought to be there the first morning they open up. You ought to be there, as I used to be in my limousine with my chauffeur, wake up, boss. It's time. They just opened the door. I'd go into these new branches, and I'd be in there for 45 minutes to an hour and 45 minutes, and I'd be the only living soul in the bank other than bank employees. These are the kinds of things you look for. You look for bank consolidation. They call it synergism when banks consolidate. You call it opportunity. You, call, you look at banks both within your local area and outside your local area. Some of you have heard me tell the story. I was in New York City getting ready to fly back to Los Angeles, and I heard a commercial for Mid-Atlantic Bank. They were called the Hungry Banker. Well, we gave them more than they could eat for many years. And while one of the first big-sized loans that I ever made was $3.5 million from Mid-Atlantic Bank, uh, and they w were doing a, an extremely aggressive advertising campaign. When you see all these tombstones, and by tombstone I mean the, the ads in the newspapers of all the deals that they've done, all the transactions they've banked, when you see all the ads in the newspapers, both the local and the Wall Street Journal, when you see ads on the newspaper, or excuse me, on the TV, and if you hear them on the radio, this is an indication that the financial institution is in a lending mode. Okay. I can guarantee, as I do in the Raising Capital Seminar, if you make two financial presentations a week, you are guaranteed to raise the money that you need. Now, you start by calling the financial institution and you ask, one, are they in the lending mode? What are you really saying when you're asking them, are they in the lending mode? You're really asking them, do they have FDIC? Do they have uh, problems with the regulatory bodies, either state or federal? You don't want to go out and waste your time unless you, you're practicing. If you know they're in financial trouble and you just need to practice, and you have no other financial institutions to practice on, that's fine. But normally you even want to practice with a financial institution that's in the lending mode. So you, you eliminate probably 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the banks in the country because they are in financial trouble. Second thing you ask for 
is you want to talk to somebody that is actually a credit officer, somebody that actually loaned money, some man, woman, or child that can write with their signature and guarantee a loan, both on a secured and an unsecured basis. You do not want to talk to a receptionist. You do not want to talk to a clerk. You don't want to talk to the guard there standing with his gun. You want to talk to somebody that can actually loan money. And you ask, and you'll be surprised they will tell you whether they have lending authority or not. You start by saying that you want to set up an appointment because you want to build a new financial relationship. You are looking at changing your current banking relationship. You are looking to change it because you are in the process of growing and for the next 12 to 36 months, you anticipate rapid growth. So you put them on notice that you're in the growing mode. What does that mean when you're in the growing mode? It means you need money. You cannot grow without money. You put them on notice that you want money, you need money, you will require money. You tell them, if this is true, your current banking relationship, to the extent that you have one, is a deposit relationship. What does that mean? It means you deposit money and they sometimes give you interest. Most of the people listening to this tape have a deposit relationship. They do not have a banking relationship. A banking relationship means they lend you money when you need it. A banking relationship is not they lend you money when you don't need it. On the, along those lines, when you finally make an appointment with someone, you, you ask them, is your bank in a position to loan outside or within a pool resource? What you're asking is, are you part of a pooled branch, 60, 80, 100 branch lending process, or are you a single branch lending process? Most everyone that's listening to this tape does not want to be part of a pooled, uh, pooled lending process. You don't want to be part of a pooled lending process because your deal will not stack up if you're a startup when measured against the benchmarks of other existing institutions that are borrowing money. So in, in review, let me just make sure you understand that. You want a bank that's in a lending mode. You want to talk to somebody that can actually lend money. You want a bank, if at all possible, that lends money at the single branch. You want to be able to borrow money at the single branch because borrowing money, contrary to what you've been told, is a person-to-person -person business. It will be based on chemistry. It will be based on does he or she believe you that you're going to really pay the money back. Okay, now, you set up an appointment. You go to the bank. If you have offices, you want them to come to your office. If you don't have offices, but you have accountants and or lawyers at this juncture, and you should, if you listen to the last tape, you should have a dream team. So you ought to be able to use your lawyer's office or accountant's office. So if you can't, you'll have the meeting at the bank. That's the least likely or the least it's not what you want to do. You want to have control. You want to have, you want to set precedent. You want to have uh, the perception being that you're a much bigger entity than you are in reality. Now, how do you um, give that impression? Well, first of all, if at all possible, you don't make the appointments. If at all possible, if you don't have a secretary, you don't have an assistant, you got a girlfriend, a wife, a mistress, you got somebody. She makes the appointments, or he, flip side if it's a woman uh, making the appointments. You, ha you set up the appointment, and you go, and first of all, what do you take to the, this first appointment? You take absolutely nothing, except your clothes that you're wearing. And what do you wear for clothes? Now, some of you that listen to these tapes live in Miami, some of you live in San Diego, Cardiff by the Sea, these, what I call the airy fairy into the continuum. I'm here to tell you that you wear a dark suit and the ladies wear corresponding clothes, whatever corresponding uniform is. Dark suit, lace shoes, dark socks, a, uh, a tie that's not conspicuously loud, um, no Rolex watches, no swatch watches. If you've got a black belt, black shoes, black band on your, on your watch, if you're wearing braces and suspenders, black on your suspenders, and you don't wear suspenders and belts, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't understand that, 
That's called belt and braces in the UK. And if you're a belt and braces guy or lady, that means you're extra safe. Uh, you you, you want to go like an IBM salesman. For some of you that have listened to me talk before, you want to go looking like Bruce Whipple's twin clone. Uh, and contrary to what people tell you, in the 90s, that's exactly how you look. You don't wear earrings. You don't wear green hair. You don't come in uh, a jumpsuit. You come looking like a professional business person. You only have one time to make a first impression. And that one time will live in your file. They will tell, they will write down their impression of you. For those of you that have ever been close to bankers, you just ask them. There's a form that they fill out in most of the big banks. That How was he? Was he intelligent? Did his project sound reasonable? Etc. Etc. You go in and with no papers, with no business plan. For those of you that have heard me talk before, you know in 25 years, until just recently, for the first time in my 25-year career, I've never been asked for a business plan. I was asked once in Phoenix, Arizona, and I was stunned. Uh, the person that asked me to visit a bank with him, I'm convinced I was asked for the business plan because he was talking about business plans. People that tell you you need business plans are people that do write software programs to sell you. They are not people that have done business. I've never had a business plan in 25 years. When I was asked for the business plan, I'm going to give you magic words to tell the banker. Or as Ted Nicholas, my good friend, uh, arguably the finest copywriter on the planet, would say, these are magic words. The magic words if you're asked for a business plan are as follows. Pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. Listen very closely. Stop the tape. Go get a pencil and pad. Do you have a pencil and pad now? Now, if you were here, I'd say, read my lips. A business plan is not necessary at this juncture, Mr. Banker. The reason it is not necessary at this juncture is you know that a business plan at best is a guess. At worst, it's a lie. You don't want me wasting my time putting down lies on paper or guesses on paper. I don't want you wasting your time reading lies or guesses. You know that I'm consolidating a fragmented industry, a cottage industry. You know that my first, second, or third acquisition will be based on numbers that are just guesses at this juncture. I think we should look at the real numbers when we find that first, second, and third acquisition. Don't you agree, Mr. Banker? And the last time that I asked this question of a banker, the banker in Phoenix, Arizona said, you're right, Mr. Pena. It would just be a guess. And we're both too busy to play with guesses. Why don't we look at the real numbers when they come down the pike? I said, thank you, Mr. Banker. Now, for those of you that don't understand English, I would stop the tape, back the tape up again, and listen to what I just said. I've been doing this 25 years, and I'm still asked by you, the attendees to my QLA seminars, and those of you that call into the office and talk to my staff, and those of you that bump into me on airports, what do I do when they ask me for a business plan? You now know. You can sell this information. You write it up on 3 by 5 cards. You can pass it out at bus stations. You can pass it out at airports. You can pass it out in front of banks. Okay. Now, for those of you that still think you need a business plan, I'm going to tell you the next magic secret. When you're... In the interviewing process, you ask the banker, may I have three referrals, satisfied bank customers that you've had in the last year? Now, the banker will be stunned. He has never been asked for a referral. He will probably tell you, yes, I have to get the, the customer's permission because he can't just be willy-nilly handing you out financial information and uh, their phone numbers. They will get back to you. They will give you three referrals. You call these referrals. Maybe you go to lunch with them. I don't believe in business lunches, but maybe you can take this guy to a lunch. If you can't afford a lunch, meet him for coffee. You will ask him what kind of relationship they have. And by the way, you obviously had a business plan. Yes, I did. It was probably approved. Yes, I did. It was approved. Do you mind giving me a copy? And guess what? The guy will give you, the gal will give you a copy of his business plan, and now you know a business plan that works. Now, for those of you that can't call the guy that 
gives a referral because it's not an 800 number and it's a toll call to you, you ask the banker, do you think that I might have a blacked out, whited out copy of a business plan that works? Because obviously you want the business plan to work and you're thinking to yourself without saying this, you want it to work because you get paid bonuses because you put money in the street. As an aside, every bank that I've talked to in the last six months has said the same thing. Never has the banking industry in this century been so flush with money. The banks are overflowing with money. It's more money chasing fewer deals, contrary to what you've been told. So now the banker will probably, if you ask him right, give you a copy of a business plan that works. If for some reason you still believe a business plan is necessary and you're afraid to call the customer that they refer to you and you're afraid to call the banker for a, a business plan that works that he has in his files, then you ask him the following questions. Do they like long plans, short plans, graphs, charts, colors? You go through the gamut of possibilities. You also can buy software. I wouldn't recommend this, but there are dozens and dozens and dozens of software packages for business plans. There's no end to business plans. I would recommend you don't do that but some of you will feel it incumbent upon yourself because you've been to some uh, guerrilla warfare marketing seminar with some guy that's made $1,500 in his whole entire lifetime told, tell, tells you that you need a business plan. You can tell this is my pet peeve. Uh, the next part of the interviewing process with a financial institution is you ask, now you're sitting before a man or a woman that can loan money. You ask them, what's your personal, unsecured, and secured lending limit? You will be the first person in his banking career that has ever asked him this question. Secured lending limit means you're having to put up collateral. You're having to put up some assets to back the loan. Unsecured is you're going to borrow the money on your own signature or non-recourse. By non-recourse, meaning the project will uh, be the only collateral for the loan. Most of the people listening to this tape will have to have secured loans. Those of you that are able to get unsecured loans or non-recourse will probably have to guarantee it with your own name. Virtually everybody listening to this tape will have to put their own few pennies on the line. If you're not willing to put your few pennies on the line, I would stop the tape right now and send it back to Doug Alpert and ask for your money back. Now, the next part of the interviewing process you're sitting there with a bank. You're telling them that you're going to consolidate your industry. You go through your mission statement, and then you stop. You've brought no papers. You shut up, and you ask, how is your bank different? How will you differentiate yourself? What are the, some of the services, the packages that I can expect, and for those of you that have employees can expect, i.e., special rates on mortgages, special credit card rates. For those of you that are uh, in the smaller towns, uh, uh, seats at the baseball games, seats at the football games, their, their hunting lodges, everything. You ask for everything and anything that you can think of, and you'll be surprised. You'll get many times exactly what you're asking for. Now, you also ask him what the financial institution's secured and unsecured lending limit is. He is One, he's never been asked what his limit is, and two, the, he's never been asked what the bank's limit is. Now, in some cases, for the, some of the small regional banks, it will be very small. I'm dealing with a bank right now, again in Hayes, Kansas, that has a lending limit of $250,000, and we're trying to borrow $500,000. Well, it's, it's, it's a kind of it's a quasi-bank. And, and they're going to have to farm out. They're going to have to participate the loan. Uh, but uh, this is, for those of you uh, uh, listening, probably not many of you will be going to Hayes, Kansas. By the way, Fort Hayes, Kansas University just won the Division II NC2A basketball championship. Division five? No, Division two. Okay. Uh, you also asked the financial institution, when, what was the last deal you got turned down? Now, if it was in your industry... I would have pause and probably end the interview and go to another bank. But you want to know the last time you lost money. 
because if it was a structure problem, if it was an industry problem, you want to know that. You don't want you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You don't want to do it again. Um, you're also asking questions. Have you ever done a five million dollar deal? When was the last five million dollar deal? Or the last one million dollar deal? Have you ever done a twenty five million dollar deal? Who needs to approve deals that are beyond your credit limit? If he says a committee at the bank, you ask them how often does the credit committee meet? Does it meet biweekly, once a month? You want the answers to these questions. What day of the week does it meet? When do I have to have a proposal into you to get it approved by the Wednesday or the Friday? I've already said you don't want a centralized lender. You want an individual lender. Are you a cash flow lender or are you an asset-based lender? And banks go in cycles. They'll be cash flow lenders for a while until they get burned on cash flow. Then they'll go back to asset lending. And then until they get burned on asset lending. By asset lending meaning that federal for the loan is basically the asset. Some of you having startups will neither be a cash flow lender or a borrower or a uh, asset borrower. That's why you'll have to have the recourse for your loan will have to be some assets that you have. They're going to ask you, they're going to probably ask you for a primary and a secondary uh, uh, basis of repaying your loan. Primary meaning hopefully the cash flow from the, the entity, the cash flow from the, the actual uh, thing that they're financing. But the secondary will be if your wife works, if you have stocks, if you have other, other assets to put on the line. I can assure you, if you are not willing to put whatever asset you have on the line and you do not sell with enthusiasm, and one of the requisites of dealing with financial institutions is to sell with enthusiasm, to, to not act as if you have limits to your abilities, and to be positive. For example, if a banker asks you, well, how do you feel uh, if the economy goes against you, the results of your project will be? What you don't say is, well, I'm not sure. What you do say is, I feel confident based on the wherewithal of the project, the wherewithal of the people involved, that we're going to be able to pay your money back in a timely fashion, irrespective of the economic cycle. You say things like, I'm looking for you to be my financial partner. It is good to have a bank as a financial partner. And you say this to each and every one of the banks. I would recommend that you interview two or three banks that you know can't do the deal for you and interview four or five banks that can. You will find that the more you interview, and by this time you've interviewed accountants, you've interviewed lawyers, you've interviewed board members, and now you're interviewing banks, the most important interviews that you will do will be the financial institutions. You will have had, if you do it right and if you paid attention and you build the dream team properly, this will be the fourth level of interviews for you. Even the slowest listening to this tape have the brain power to do this. The smartest listening to the tape will do it obviously a little more effectively. Whether you're smart or, or, or not so smart or whether you're at the Norman Schwarzkopf end of the continuum or you're at the Henry Kissinger and in the continuum, it is extremely doable. It can be done. It will be done. Now, you've got to get them excited. I can't emphasize that enough. You've got to tell them that you're going to give them all the legitimate business you can. You've got to tell them that as you grow, you're going to, your not just your acquisition, but other people that you meet in the industry that you're going to push towards this financial institution. And whatever you do, you never, ever, ever, ever share a doubt with a financial institution. That doesn't mean you lie to them. I'm not saying that. But you don't share a doubt. If you're fighting with your mother-in-law, who's a partner, if you're fighting with your, your brother, who's a partner, if you're fighting with your wife, who's a partner, if you're two months behind in your house payments, unless specifically asked, these are not doubts you share. For example... When Donald Trump filed bankruptcy a number of years ago for a couple, three billion dollars, on the Friday, everything couldn't be better. On the Monday, he filed bankruptcy. High-performance people don't share doubts. 
And the last person you share a doubt with is your financial institution. Everything is rosy. And if you think it's rosy, the chances are it'll stay rosy. You never volunteer negative stuff. The deal's always hot. In fact, I use the word that transcends hot. I don't want to get into my Bo Derek metaphor here because women and children may be listening to this tape someday when you leave it in your car. Okay. Now, um, before you leave the bank, the last question you ask the bank, are there any conflicts? This will blow the banker's socks off. He will think that you're a professional. He will think that you've been there, that you've done that. And with the board that you've built up and the chairman that you've acquired for your dream team, he will just think that you're an actual extension of this professionalism. You pick five banks, you go to them, you do the interviewing process, you narrow it down to two or three banks, then the final portion or the final bit is to get the banks to bid against one another. I use the example where we had actually nine banks bidding, actually only seven of the banks bid for the business we had in Fresno with Casey. I believe it was seven because two of the banks were so small um, that um, they couldn't bid on the business. But the other seven banks were willing to bid and we actually put it out to four or five of the banks and as I told you, the existing bank uh, got the business. But you want them to bid. You go to bank A and you find out the term. You get a term sheet. You go to Bank B, you tell them what the term sheet is. Or no, you ask Bank B for their terms. And if they're not better, you say Bank A's terms are better than Bank B. You can do it with, if, when you get good at it, you can do it with four or five financial institutions at the same time. But the real terms, the only part of the term sheet that you're interested in is if you can have all the money that you think you need, more than you think you need, the interest rate isn't that important. 25 or 50 basis points or a quarter of a percent to a half a percent shouldn't kill your deal. If that kills your deal, then something's wrong with your deal. The important thing is to be able to get the money when you want the money. In the interviewing process, you tell the bankers that in three to six months, you believe that you're going to need money for acquisition. Now, whether it happens, see, you, you believe. You don't know. In three to five weeks when it happens, they're not surprised. You don't come in January 3 needing money January 4. The perception must be with a financial institution that you, you're sophisticated enough, you're experienced enough, you have enough financial acumen that you know that you ask for money when you don't need it. Now, for some of you listening to the tape, you're going to need the money to make payroll. You can't let that notion come across to the banker. If necessary, you will miss payroll. If necessary, you will miss a mortgage payment or two. I'm not recommending that, but if necessary, to to let the financial institution believe that you are in a in a in a in a, uh, in a position for growth. Um, it's not hard. It's really quite easy once you're used to it. The hard part is doing it the first few times. Once you've done it the first few times, and you've done it as many times as I've had, it becomes quite easy. Um, during these financial presentations, during these financial interviews, during these financial beauty contests, as I call them, you can go with your chief financial officer. Remember, someone on your board, the finance person, will be more or less your interim chief financial officer who will then have already received equity. He can go to these financial presentations with you. Uh, to make them easier. Uh, uh, ultimately, you can do the financial presentations by yourself. Uh, now, um, when you get good, you can do some a great deal of this financial, these financial presentations on the phone at the juncture of the most people that are listening. In fact, probably everybody that's listening to this tape, you're not there yet. You have now got one or two banks. You got your dream team in place, it's now time to review the market looking for consolidated and fragmented industries or cottage industries. This will be the subject of another tape um, in the near future. Now I want to open it up to questions on um, 
financial institutions and interviewing financial institutions. The question is, how do you respond to the question, where the equity is coming from? Well, first of all, all transactions don't need equity. That's the first answer. That's the first answer I always give. You don't know until you structure the deal whether you need equity or not. For example, you're buying a company for $100,000. And the gentleman's going to take back $60,000 in paper. In other words, he's going to carry back a note for $60,000. So you only have to put up $40,000. So you're only financing 40% of the business. If the existing cash flow can finance 40%, you've got, what you've got is tantamount to a 60% equity play already. Too often you say, I don't know where the equity is coming from. And that is the last answer. Better you cut your tongue out before you give that answer. I mean, um, the other side of it is that if you're not going to have owner finance transactions, you will say that the equity is coming from a combination. This is important. Stop the tape. Write it down on a piece of paper. It is going to come from a combination of various sources that are directly or indirectly related to our board of directors. That answer is legitimate. It covers all the bases. It is absolutely bona fide. Next question. Yes. The question was, uh, earlier on in the tape, I said that uh, you will be, requ- be required to put up personal assets. Uh, and what if you're lacking in personal a- assets? Uh, what I think you meant to say is, what if you're dead broke? <laughs> okay. If you're dead broke, people finance things when they're dead broke. I mean, but the financial institution that's willing to finance your deal, I assure you, is not around the corner by the 7-Eleven. You will have to go out and search wide and far. The company that you're starting will probably have little or no assets. So the thing that I normally recommend that people say is that this is a startup company. Come out, be upfront about it. It's a startup company. Don't try to BS the guy or the gal. It's a startup company, has little or no assets. Now. When I say a startup, people think that I've dumped five million dollars in it. But it's, you know, I'm involved in some startup companies. I tell them it's got virtually no assets. And that the loan will have to stand on its own. It will have to be non-recourse financing. They will say most banks don't like to do non-recourse financing. Some banks still do if it's the strength of the deal. Now, this is the key. Most of the people listening to this tape, their deal sucks. Get a pencil, get a piece of paper, stop the tape, listen carefully. Most of your deals don't hunt. Those dogs don't hunt. And you wonder why you can't get them financed. The whole methodology behind quantum leap uh, uh, precepts is to get a dog that hunts. Most of you keep trying to hunt with a pickanese, you know, and it just it, it doesn't work. And the, so the object of quantum leap methodology is to get a dog that hunts. And those of you that get a dog that hunts, you keep it on a leash. A dog can't hunt on a leash. You've got to find a deal that works. Some of you that are listening to the tape ought to just turn the key on your deals and walk away. Close your business down or not even start it. Too many of us in business, in life, try to fix and make it work. Quantum leap methodology is walking away from things that don't work to things that just do work. Remember, we high performance people do more of what they do right and they try to eliminate what they don't do well. First thing is to pick a deal. You've heard me say the deal is either hot or it's not hot. If the deal is hot, then that means it's, it's cash flowing or you're going to be able to find finance for it. One of the ways that you will be able to um, help that process is you're going to have to be willing, even if you have no assets, the financial institution would rather have not only the entity collateralizing loan, 
even your name, even if you've got no assets. And uh, and that takes grit. You've got to step up to the line. And um, for those of you that have heard me before, you know that I've been financially dead five times. So I've, I've done that. You will not be able to, unless it's an extremely good deal that is a cash flow animal from the beginning, not be able to uh, have at least your own signature uh, guaranteeing um, the, uh, the debt. If you have real estate that's underwater, the banks can make it right. So, I mean, for those of you that are listening to these tapes that have assets that are the loans have turned upside down, the bank will still, they want something to fill their file with. They want something to fill their file with. And let me back up a sidebar comment on financial institutions. They will want to fill their file for due diligence. They will want anything and everything on you, which probably they, there hasn't been that much written on you, but for sure your directors. So you want to, you want to send them all kinds of data on your industry. You want to send them all kinds of data in addition to the profiles uh, on your other board members. You want to send them all kinds of data if there's national associations that cover your industry. You want their, their file to be two or three inches thick. You, you want a lot of stuff in the file because that's their, you know, their, their CYA. That's, that means they did work. And they'll do their own due diligence on top of it. Yeah, I was just asked, uh, would you include a, a criminal uh, check, uh, crim check as it's called, or um, uh, some of the things small banks might not uh, uh, be able to get readily. You can put anything in your file that's good. Um, don't be putting things in your file. I'm, you know, if you ask, you don't, obviously you tell the truth. The basis of this whole program is honesty, integrity, and, 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 and doing things that are moral. But I mean, you want to fill the file up with everything. Now, I don't, I don't put clippings from my high school days, but I mean, I've, I've still got stuff, information in my file that dates back 15 years. Um, a lot of people listening to tapes, their careers are only two or three or four years, uh, old. I have a young partner who graduated from Cornell, and she, the first, and I always say, put the best foot forward. So the first sentence of her profile is, graduate of Cornell University. And, uh, and then it, it uh, so you put your best foot forward. You put the best information. And whatever information you give them has got to be accurate. Because it'll be a red flag if you said you went to, you graduated from, uh, uh, University of Missouri and you, you know, you, uh, you really are two units short. A lot of people put PhD down, but they didn't finish their dissertation. They did all the, the classroom work. I mean, banks look for things like this. Okay. The first time is the first time is the, uh, the the interviewing process. And by the way, the interviewing process for the banks goes two or three times, just as the other. You give them normally after the second interview, they're selling you, and they'll say, "Well, what do, what do you have for us to get more comfortable?" It's after the second interview you send them all your stuff, you send them the file, and it's an ongoing process. You want to continue to send them things. If something else comes on, you add a new board member. There's a new study written about your industry. You want to send it to him. You don't want to take the chance that he's going to look for it and miss it, or she's going to look for it and miss it. So by the time you have narrowed it down to two or three financial institutions, you have now got their file built up. Um, and um, I do not personally send them pro formers on what our deals might look like, because if you send them a pro forma on what a deal might look like, you can bet your sweet butt it will be in concrete. That will be the benchmark that they will use the measure from. Yes. Correct. Uh, I one of the, one of the benchmarks that I use is I always ask for more money than I think I'm going to need. The operative word is think, since it's a guess anyway. And since most of the people listening to this tape are inexperienced, you're going to guess low. You're going to guess high on revenue, low on expense. You're going to underestimate how much time it's going to take. 
and you're going to underestimate how much money you're going to need. So I ask for, and I recommend you ask for, a lot more than you think you're going to need. There's nothing wrong with that because you think you're going to need it. And my rule of thumb is things always take three times longer and cost three to five times more than budgeted in a startup. Always. So I ask for a lot more. People say you can't borrow more than you purchase things for, and that's not true. I've financed real estate at 120 or 125% of purchase price and had no equity in it before, and I've done it recently. I mean, you can. You might not be able to do it at the Bank of America across the street. You may have to go to the northern part of your state. You may have to go to uh, a different state. Uh, I would recommend everybody listening to the state that is really in the hunt attend our Raising Capital Seminar because we go into how we differentiate and how we delineate um, finding both traditional and non-traditional financing entities. But ask for more than you think you need. No, no, no. Anything that's ever been written about you, positive. Anything that's ever been written about your company, positive. Anything that's ever been written about your industry, if you're in a niche industry, positive. Uh, anything that is generic about your industry, if you're in the entertainment industry, and the entertainment's going to grow uh, exponentially. For example, in, in the um, mobile home park industry, since not between 1992 and 1994, the mobile home parks sold has increased by 50%. That's a massive thing. For example, in the mobile home park industry, with downsizing, re-engineering, people that had a, a salary of $65,000 a year now re-engineered for a pension of $26,000 a year. They can't afford to live where they're going to live. So anything in the Wall Street Journal or in the New York Times or in the, uh, the business journals that indicate about downsizing, we put in our file because people are going to have to live someplace that they can live a lot cheaper. Well, they don't have many alternatives. I mean, there's 50,000 plus mobile home parks in the country. They're going to have to live in one of those. I mean, anything that's like that that shows that the, the, uh, the industry or the trend is shifting your way, anything that shows that anything that you've done in the past has been real smart, like you bought this, you produced this, you're part of this joint venture, um, any of the people that you're entertaining doing business with. If you're in the entertainment business and you're discussing something with Steven Spielberg, for example, you put everything you can find in the library about Steven Spielberg. I mean, you want that file to be thick. I mean, you want him to use it. If he's a short guy or gal, you want him to be able to use it like a telephone book to sit on. I mean, you want a thick file. Uh, and the more you do their work for them, the better. Some of the best investment banking firms, uh, some of the best mortgage brokers that I've known, package the thing just like they want it. They don't put, you know, if they want a blue paper, it's on blue paper. If it's in a red binder, it's a red binder. I used to have a saying, and because I'm in the textile business now, if they want a red dress, I stand under a red light. If they want a blue dress, I stand under a blue light. You put as much data as possible. And with computers the way they are now, and with research librarians the way they are now, you can get all the data, I mean, that you, 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 you possibly could want or the, the banker or the financial institution could possibly ever dream of reading. You want them to think that your research has been mammoth because that gives them comfort that, gee, look at all the stuff that this guy or this gal has done and, and then they move forward from there. And... You want to give them every reason, every every opportunity to approve what you're doing. Okay, well, we have now got down on what I call our flow chart from building a dream team, remembering from the chairman to the other directors, a national 
hopefully international law firm along with a big six accounting firm. We have now used that dream team to interview financial institutions. We will next show how you use that combined package of assets to review your market for consolidation in our next audio tape. Good luck and good hunting. Look forward to talking to you soon.